Latter-day Contemplation is a podcast hosted by two Latter-day Saints who have found great value in experiencing God through walking a path of contemplation. The views expressed herein are our own. Hello and welcome to Latter-day Contemplation. We are your hosts, Christopher Hurtado and Riley Risto. Latter-day Contemplation started as an exploration of contemplative practices from many traditions to enhance our discipleship of Jesus Christ. We're by no means experts in the topics we discuss, but what we have is an openness to questions, a hunger to discover truth wherever we can find it, and a desire to share in the transformative life of inner peace. We love that you've joined us, and we hope that you find value in this community. Well, welcome back to Latter-day Contemplation. I'm joined today by a good friend of the podcast, Phil McLemore. Christopher Hurtado is dealing with some back pain that he's had for a few weeks, which is the the main excuse for us not being able to record lately. And uh, so for those who've missed us, we're glad to be back, and we uh, we hope you'll be patient with us as we try to get back on track. We've got some exciting news we want to share with our audience. First, uh, Latter-day Contemplation, as part of Latter-day Peace Studies, is now a designated 501c3 nonprofit, which means we can accept your donations tax-free. And uh, if you would like a receipt for that, then you would obviously enjoy the tax benefit of that as well. But uh, we're trying to raise a little bit of funds right about now to help us with some expenses, um, not the least of which is obtaining that 501c3 status. So if you can go to latterdaypeacestudies.org, we have a link to our PayPal for donations there. You can set up a repetitive or one-time donation. We'd very much appreciate that if this is of value to you. And then uh, we're also soliciting a little help. Uh, We, from time to time, need editors or co-hosts or social media help, maybe a little design help for our website. And if you're interested in contributing to Latter-day Peace Studies, reach out to us on our Facebook page, or you can hit up me or Christopher Hurtado or Ben Peterson from our sister podcast, Come follow me on uh, Messenger, Facebook Messenger. So we'd love to hear from you. Uh, Lastly, we were recently recognized by the Association for Mormon Letters as a top five podcast for the year in the the Mormon space, uh, you might say. And so we're honored, and that's that's a great uh, opportunity for us to spread the word as well about uh, these contemplative practices that we're trying to get out there. So if you enjoy this podcast, please like, comment, share with your friends, and reach out to us if you have any feedback whatsoever. We want to hear it all. So we appreciate you as our audience. And now for the show. So as I mentioned, we've got Phil McLemore on the podcast today. Phil, how are you doing? Great. Good. Phil's been with us a a few times on various episodes, and uh, we've already introduced him uh, at length in the past. So if you're interested in learning more about Phil... And his work, uh, please check out those other episodes that we've recorded with him uh, in our library. But today, I invited him on uh, for a specific reason. You know, I, there's this book, Phil, that's been out for, I don't know, a year or so, and it's it's gaining a lot of traction. Almost everyone that I know who's into this sort of thing has read the book, Atomic Habits by James Clear. And I thought it would be interesting to do a show on habits and sort of where habits intersect or interface with religious practice and spiritual practices such as rituals and traditions and customs, uh, ordinances, and how we can use habits to our advantage. And maybe in some cases, how habits might limit us, um, limit our our ability to make choices and transformation that is part of the, the Christian disciple's life. So to kind of open up the conversation, Phil, there's this the main, I guess what I, what I would call the main idea of atomic habits is this. James Clear says, your identity emerges out of your habits. Every action is a vote for the type of person you wish to become. And then I'm going to continue on just another quote that's just a few pages after that. It says, becoming the best version of yourself requires you to continuously edit your beliefs and to upgrade and expand your identity. So what are your thoughts on, on those sort of uh, themes that arise out of the book, Phil? Yeah, that's uh, a great perspective. My wife is part of a book club, and they read this uh, about a year ago, and then she encouraged me to read it, and then we, we shared it together. But absolutely, your habits, which tick away day after day after day, and they relate to 
how you think and how you see things and how you react to things and what you do and what you respond to, all of those things are going to contribute positively to a, a substantive identity or they're going to take away from it. So it, it really does matter what your habits are and to get some sort of conscious awareness and and maybe even mastery of your habits so that you can be the person you really want to be or to be the person that you have the potential to be. It matters a lot. And, and I've heard this said over the last few months, and perhaps it was cribbed out of the book itself, that basically everything we do and are boils down to our habits, not only just our identity, but really what carries us through each day is is just habit. It's the thing, it's the routines that we have become accustomed to. And, you know, being stuck in, in either destructive or even just kind of robotic habits is, is such a damaging thing in terms of how we use our time on this, this earth. Sure. It's interesting to me as I talk with people, most people do have a sense that they're making choices, a lot of choices throughout their day. Uh, and that they're really making the choice themselves. When anytime I do a meditation seminar or workshop, I bring this up early on in the in the presentation. And when I ask people to take a moment and just really reflect on their day and how many how many uh, choices that a person makes are from conscious awareness, and how much are the result of patterns or conditioning or habits that have developed throughout their life, what absolutely amazes me is that about 90% of the people will say, well, when I really think about it, uh, I really don't seem to be making many conscious choices. I seem to be reacting. And this has to do with, again, how you see things, how you think about things and interpret things, how you feel, how you react. Uh, It affects all of those different dimensions. And there have been some studies that indicate that most people are really bundles of unconscious habits and reactive patterns, patterns based around fears and desires. And by the time a person, they debate this, but by the time a person's around 18 years old or maybe a little older, 90 plus percent of our choices are really responses to patterns. Um, They're habits and they're not the result of conscious decision making. And so if you don't have little, if you have just very little conscious choice in your life, then who or what, who or what is determining my identity? Who is determine who or what is determining what I'm about and what I can do and accomplish and so forth? From a church perspective, this really matters because in our typical teaching, we talk a lot about using our agency to be obedient or using our agency to be a more Christ-like person. But if people have a very limited use of agency, I mean, if they're really not making conscious choices most of the time, then that teaching might not be real helpful. I And, and if you're not succeeding in making better choices because you're somewhat enslaved by habits, then that's going to produce a tremendous amount of guilt and shame and a sense of failure. So I always suggest in spiritual teaching that we talk a lot about just not using our agency, but what can we do to expand our agency? What can we do to expand our consciousness so that our choices are coming from awareness and not habits and patterns and so forth? Wow. Yeah, I love that. There's so much to unpack there. You know, it it called to mind a couple things for me. One is this idea that was um, brought forth and and sort of he became a main proponent of this idea by Elder Bednar, who who really encouraged people to become agents unto themselves and not be acted upon. And I, I think that really speaks to what you're getting at there. You know, we're constantly acted upon by outside forces, our environment, the accumulated force and effect of our habits that have been built up, whether positive or negative, over a period of time. And like you said, 19 years, you know, I mean, that's that's really a disheartening <laughs> thought, you know, that some that ninety percent of our patterns are set by the time we're just escaping adolescence. That's so disheartening, and so this idea that it's the importance of expanding our agency 
cannot be underestimated. There's a there's a scripture that I pulled out in Second uh, Peter chapter two, and verse nineteen. It says, "While they promise them liberty or agency, as the case may be, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage." And of course, this isn't necessarily referring to any specific person or group. It's more speaking to this idea that uh, when you become enslaved to unconscious habits or bad habits, then that corruption overcomes your ability to exercise agency and really, you know, expand or transform within the sphere of of your mortal uh, probation. And and so it becomes super important to try to find practices. And, and we would suggest that contemplative practices are really the key here, meditation being foremost, trying to find those practices whereby we can expand and reinvigorate our agency. Oh, absolutely. Um, that verse in the Book of Mormon is one of the great verses that, that the intent is that we act and are not acted upon. And it's important to understand some of the challenge uh, I did marriage counseling as a military chaplain for 20 years. I don't recommend it. And it's a bit frustrating because so few people are really successful in making substantive changes. And it's because of these these um, unconscious habits and patterns. I think it's helpful to realize that our deepest, deepest instinct way down in the cellular level is survival. And so our our mind is always on alert for things that uh, uh, might be fearful or things that might enhance our survival. So just automatically, the, the, the brain and the body are working together to maintain our survivability. And it's not necessarily done in the, in the wisest way. Um, and of course, the brain itself loves economy of function. So the brain loves patterns and having the same thing repeated over and over. So in some ways, our mind and body, coupled with survival instinct, drives a lot of the way we see things and interpret things and the, and the choices we make. And, and our mind, when we have thoughts, chemicals are created that then interact with the body, communicate with the body. And something odd that can happen is your your emotional reactions to things can become so strong and so powerful that the body then can begin to exercise undue influence on the mind. And so there's been a lot of, of uh, talk in the last oh, couple of decades about how maybe our subconscious is actually encoded in the body, chemically coded in the body. And so uh, Candace Pert some years ago wrote a book called Your Body is Your Subconscious Mind, and others have followed up on that. So um, if, in fact, we're going to try to change habits in a positive way, we've got to find a way to enter into this subconscious level. Um, most people, they'll be unhappy with something they're doing. They'll decide in their mind, oh, I want to be better, or I want to change, or I want to do this better. But they're just trying to do it through thinking. And then they've got their body already established in a different set of patterns working against them. And so that is another aspect that weighs on whether a person can be successful or not. So I, I think genuine spiritual practice, which, as you mentioned, I think is the key to expanding agency, should involve both mind and body ultimately under the in influence of the soul or the spirit or the divine nature within us. You know, it, there's a, there's an interesting quote from the book that I, I took to mean maybe something that, that wasn't intended, but I'm going to talk about that for a sec because you brought it to my mind. There's a quote out of the book that says, it is the anticipation of a reward, not the fulfillment of it, that gets us to take action. And I would say the same for uh, not just reward, but, you know, the pain that, that comes as the opposite uh, phenomenon. The greater the anticipation, the greater the dopamine spike. So what that's talking about there is some of that, th those endorphins that tend to influence our body beyond or take control over our mind um, because we're not adept or practiced at quieting 
the carnal desires or the will of the flesh. And it's interesting to me that one of the primary functions of religious uh, practices and rituals is to have us quiet the carnal mind, quiet the carnal desires, and sort of turn off those um, strictly responsive reactionary um, or, or reactions that we have to chemicals. Um, and it's one thing to to hijack dopamine in a positive way, but it's quite another when dopamine hijacks our free will in in not positive ways. And and so that's where we can start to see some of these spiritual practices benefit us by the ability to quiet and sit in that that space of of peace and stillness, quieting all of the the processes of the body and, and tapping back into our source spirit and and by doing so, you know, expand our our ability to cope with the undue influence of of these systems on our agency. Oh yeah. I I I mean I'm a yoga meditation teacher and I I in terms of style and format and practice, I do contextualize my teaching in in what I believe to be the true teachings of Jesus. So it's kind of a Christian yogic blend. But in the classic yoga system of meditation, after laying a foundation of, of what it means to live a moral and responsible life, implying that, look, okay, look, do your best to have stability in your life by being kind, by having control of, of carnal desires and needs and so forth. Um, it, it recognizes the fact that until there's a, a deeper inner transformation or change of heart, that might be difficult. But then the yoga system moves into stilling the mind, using breath to calm and still the body and mind, and then to internalize your attention with your senses turned off. You know, it's our senses interacting with the material world that get us into a lot of uh, problems or at least cause a lot of the habitual development and how we manage the world. So to have a spiritual practice where you can turn off the senses, calm the mind, calm the body, put your attention within where you can draw on a, a deeper spiritual awareness and even spiritual power, then you're in a pretty good position to start working with these very difficult um survival instincts and brain function and habit formation and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I, in the, in the yoga tradition, I believe the, the word for the illusion of reality that's caused by the material is Maya. And, and that Maya is sort of like, it's necessary, but it's also, it's also the thing that we have to overcome. Right. Like it, like it's necessary to have us and help us to develop the ability to quiet the very thing that is vexing us, right? That's right. It, it's almost it's it's very contradictory in a sense, sort of a catch twenty two. But th- this illusion that we live in that we are our bodies or that we are our actions, rather than we are eternal spirit, we are connected as one unified in in the divinity of of god that separation is the thing that we're supposed to overcome but it's hard for us to realize our unity until we've gone through the practice of quieting the material right and you know ultimately here we want to expand our ability to make choices in harmony with the presence and the nature and the character of god not because he wants that for some odd reason. It's because that's what's going to develop us into a Christ-like being. And so it's, it's, it's by tapping into that deeper source of divine nature, divine presence, divine being, divine grace, that we can expand our awareness and then draw on a source of strength to be able to change you know, what, we, what we would call bad habits and and establish good patterns and good habits that are in harmony with with uh, Christ-like nature or, or God's nature. 
you know, I want to go backward a little bit. You talked about the the uh, momentum or inertia of the habits that we develop coming out of adolescence by the age of 19. And I was just thinking to myself, you know, it, it's a little different for you and I who were, were converts to the church, but we did have uh, church practice as Catholics, right, uh, in, our, in our adolescence. And I, I remember not really getting it all that much, to be honest. And I think that that's that's not a negative. Uh, it, you know, Richard Rohr talks about this, Richard Rohr being a Catholic himself, a monk, or, or a, uh, not a monk, a, uh, well, I guess he is a monk. Is he a Franciscan? I can't remember uh, what is. his order is. Yeah, yeah. He is. So he wrote this book called Falling Upward, and, and he really talks about the two halves of life. And in the first half of life, he recognizes the the critical importance of traditions uh, and, and uh habits and, and rituals that we participate in that we might have almost no idea what they're all about. But he, he, he identifies the importance of those things. And, and to those things, he attaches that importance because it's the, it's the, um, the development of those habits early on that will carry us through for the rest of our life. Like we, we have in, at that age, in that adolescent age, we really have no idea why on a weekly basis we have to eat bread that symbolizes flesh and drink water or wine that symbolizes blood. It, it makes no objective sense uh, to us. There, there's really nothing about it that, that just screams importance other than we're told to do it first by Christ and then by you know every leader that followed or disciple that followed Christ after the fact. But we just don't get it. There's there doesn't seem to be any rational explanation for it until we we hit adulthood, and then we start to analyze these questions um, from a more mature standpoint and say, well, why do we do that? And it it seems to me that these rituals are a means whereby we can begin to. Uh, normalize our spiritual practice. And a lot of the things that we take for granted, you, you know, you're, you're fond of saying that what religion provides for us is the foundation of a moral, ethical, responsible life. Absolutely. And without those practices, without, you know, those, those ordinances or rituals, it's tough to envision having the structure necessary to develop into that kind of a person prior to expanding on the spiritual practices that we're talking about here with, with meditation and contemplation. Yeah. And, and a person's ability to comprehend what the deeper meaning might be or what participation in the ordinance would cause a, a deeper realization or expansion of, of the soul. So yeah, at first ordinances tend to be somewhat external actions and somewhat ritualistic. I mean, we do talk about the meaning of the sacrament, let's say, as being renewal of our covenants, which we then translate into obedience. But again, if our lives are dominated by, by bad habits and reactive patterns, then we make these good efforts to be faithful to covenants and to keep commandments. But there's often a tremendous amount of failure because people are dominated by, by uh, unhealthy habits or lower nature habits and so forth. And you know, in John 6, where you have Jesus talking about the symbolism, you know, of eating the flesh and drinking the blood by partaking of the bread and wine, he tells us, and it's in verse 52 or 3 in there, where he says that he who eats my flesh abides in me and I in him. In the end, this is about abiding in Christ and by and partaking of his nature by so abiding. So there is this very deep, mystical meaning in the ordinance of the sacrament. So it's more than just um, a renewal of a covenant. It's more than just examining yourself, as Paul says, to see where I failed and where I might want to succeed. It's literally participating in the sacrament in such a way that you sense that you are abiding in the presence and the nature of Christ. And it's by consciously abiding in that presence that there's a flow of grace that's empowering that helps us to overcome uh, what 
I'm calling now lower nature habits and and adopt uh, patterns of perspective and behavior that are going to be more Christ-like. Well, and, and this, I mean, interesting thing about the sacrament as we're as we're talking about this, you know, the the base understanding of this renewal of covenants is actually just a modern Mormon cultural interpret interpolation. That that's not something that uh, Jesus never instituted the the Eucharist, the Last Supper, as a means of rem- reminding people about their baptism. That right. that wasn't the purpose behind it. That's that's sort of Mormon cultural interpolation, a- and it sort of becomes a distraction for what it really is. One of the most important uh, words in the sacrament prayer itself is remember, and and it's really about that that remembrance of ourselves and our nature and our connection with deity, abiding in deity in Christ. That that is the real reason or purpose behind that standalone ordinance. This is not just an appendage ordinance that's attached to baptism in some way. In fact, it really has no relationship to baptism outside of outside of remembering or renewal. There's not much of a connection there. That's 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 an invention. And so it's, it sort of has just distracted us over time. And it's something that I would like to see us get away from and maybe get back to the real meaning of the of the Holy Last Supper as, as an ordinance of uh, unification with deity. Oh, I, I agree completely. We, we've made it utilitarian, which is our nature, and uh, when in fact it was intended to be a, a profound, um, I don't want to be misunderstood by saying mystical, but it was meant to be a profound inner mystical experience where there's some sensing, there's some communion with the actual presence and nature and character of God that's transformative. I mean, the sacrament really should be a uh, an experience of some degree of inner awakening and inner transformation as we partake of the essence of God, the essence of Christ. And so it is much, much deeper than we normally talk about it. And that's the sacrament is always, I always look forward to the sacrament because I have my own little inner ritual that I do uh, during the sacrament time. And it is that reaching out to discern the, the presence of Christ and then to experience what I believe others experienced historically when they were in his presence, the, the transformative impact of simply being in the presence of Christ. I mean, if you think about Mary and the Mary and Martha story, you know, this big dinner is going on and she probably has some responsibility. She cannot resist sitting in his presence and being enlightened and healed and uplifted and so forth. And um, and Jesus, of course, ends up calling that the needful thing, you know, uh, the most important thing that was going on there. So when I... When I, I, I've taught this in several of my seminars, but when I'm in the sacrament inside, I'm chanting the ancient Christian prayer, come Lord Jesus, come. And it's synchronized with my breath. And so I chant that, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus, come. And I chant that until an awareness opens of the presence of Christ. Then the chant stops and then I, my objective then is to abide in the awareness of that presence. And all I can say is it matters. It, it changes mind and heart. There's a grace that flows through that. So for me, the sacrament, the, the sacrament ordinance every Sunday is, is a profoundly transformational experience for me. Yeah, imagine taking that approach to all of the rituals or ordinances that we practice within the church. I mean, it could it could take your spirituality to the next level. That's what that's what that transform transformation is all about. And uh, making those things a habit, you know, really strengthens our connection with with Christ Jesus in that way. I, I love that. We're, that's something that I I'm going to make a mental note to share uh, by the time we end this podcast in about a half an hour. Um, just as a last reminder, I think that's a fantastic way to approach the ordinance of the sacrament. 
So Phil, I wanted to, in some sense, try to parse out some of these terms that perhaps they're synonymous. There's some overlap for sure, but I want to uh, sort of delineate so that we can identify how these various tools can be used in our life to strengthen our, our spirituality. So we've established what habits are, kind of a settled, regular practice that's done almost without thinking about it. That's something that you, you, you certainly have to develop it, but once it's developed, it becomes autonomic and it just becomes regular and you no longer have to worry about. And that's, that's, that can be had for good and evil, right? So you can, you can establish really good habits or you can establish really destructive habits. And it is certainly something we should be aware of. And awareness is the core of contemplation. So we ought to be always aware of the, the unconscious habits that we're developing for good or for evil in our lives and apply our will towards refining those habits. Kind of uh, the next level might be routines, which would be sort of a set of habits. Or if you took a, a fixed period of time, let's say just a day, most people have a daily routine. And depending on the day, it might be different from day to day. But let's say Tuesdays. Okay, I know on Tuesdays, typically, I go to work at a certain time. I do a meditation for a certain amount of time. I go to lunch at a certain amount of time. I record the podcast here at 3 p.m. on Tuesdays, typically. So this is my Tuesday routine. You know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, my routine is to do all those same things except throw a workout in, take out the podcast. Friday, I leave work a little earlier, maybe. So these are all just various routines, which are just sets of habits. They're agenda-driven. They're a set of actions that have sort of become habitual. The next level, I think the higher up this scale or this uh, hierarchy you walk, these habitual practices, which turn into routines, then become even stronger. We start to imbue them with meaning beyond the individual habits themselves. And that's where we step into the realm of rituals. And uh, if you were to take kind of the secular version of, of rituals, it might be like customs or something like that. I mean, you can even look at uh, <clears throat> many of the ritualistic things we do in government, you know, where there's there's a song involved and people stand up and they they put their hand on their heart or they you know the presidential medal of freedom is presented to so and so and there's this emblem or a token that's put around someone's neck and words are spoken and da 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 da, da. so those are all sort of like ritualistic you know very religious in nature and what what is the effect or difference between these sort of higher order habits, which we call rituals, and, and our base everyday unconscious actions that become habitual. And, and what is, we've talked a little bit about some of the purpose, but how do we, um, how do we derive meaning from rituals as opposed to just habits? Oh boy. For me, rituals are, are holy habits. They're, it's a way that I structure time and place and even the setup during that time to support my deepest spiritual longings and desires to, to be realized. So I'm a very ritualistic person, and the idea behind it is to have a particular time and place and setup where I can experience an expansion of consciousness, an expansion of awareness of the presence of God. And then in that context and the lingering effect of that, free myself from subconscious or unconscious habits that don't prove to be helpful or healthy, and to be able to establish in my life things that I, from the heart, really, really want to do and, and want to accomplish. So. You know, one of the most important things I teach about, let's say, a contemplative prayer practice or a meditation practice is consistency. If you're not doing it daily, generally speaking, you're leaving yourself more at the mercy of what we've talked about, the, the way the brain works and the way habits develop and so forth. I mean, most of our day, when, when we work and when we do things and when we engage with the world around us, it is supporting the the uh, ego sense of self or the natural man sense of self and 
that typically is reactive and and uh, to some degree limited by our habitual and patterned perceptions and responses and so forth. So if you don't have this ritual time, this holy time that's consistent, then you're really turning yourself over to a life that's going to continue to support unhealthy habits and so forth. It, it's a miracle. I mean, it's a miracle that you could spend 30 minutes a day or an hour a day, you know, maybe reading scriptures and pondering and then con contemplating and praying deeply or meditating. I mean, it's a miracle that that little bit of time every day can transform your whole life, right? Because it's it's the 2% fighting against the 98%, but because it's divine and becomes and because it comes in the context of the love and the grace of God, it has a power that can overcome, you know, what we typically call natural man or egoic functions. But if you're not doing it regularly, then you're going to continue to have that that uh, negative side reinforced. So I think regular ritual, whether it's corporate with people you worship with, and for me, most importantly, the, the rituals that you establish in your own private spiritual practice just have to be consistent. You know, hypothetically speaking, Phil, if someone were to give you a magic button and say, Phil, I can make you a sure promise that if you will hit this button for 30 minutes a day, that it will completely transform your life for the better. Would you hit that button? Oh, absolutely. For 30 minutes a day? Like, oh, yeah. And I think that most people, if you put that button in front of them and told them, just hit this button for 30 minutes a day and it's a guarantee you're going to feel better about your life, most people are going to hit that button. Oh, yeah. So what is it that prevents people from from spending 30 day, thirty minutes a day or, or 20 or even 15 in in meditation or contemplation. what What is the mental block that we... It's ironic, isn't it? That you, you just said we tap into this godly power and it's, the, it's that significance of being connected with deity that really makes it so special and the grace of God opens up for us. But yet that's almost the, the block, the mental block that right. keeps us from doing it. Like, oh, if I don't do this right, I'm going to be judged by God or whatever. What is it that keeps us from doing that? Well, there is a learning curve, and there needs to be a little faith and patience in learning contemplative practices because they are so different from the way we normally live. And so it can be uncomfortable, if not troubling at first, to some people. So to sit in silence or to sit quietly can be very disturbing to people. They kind of have to face how they're thinking and how they're feeling and you know, things that we normally repress come into consciousness, into awareness, and that's not a lot of fun for folks. So um, a lot of people who try these things give up within the first two weeks because it's just different, it's uncomfortable, and they haven't tasted the fruit of it yet, right? It takes a little faith and patience to to have the benefit so you can taste the fruit. Once you taste the fruit, then it becomes self-motivating. But for some people, it might take uh, several weeks or maybe a couple of months to establish themselves in this practice where they can relax, let go of the, the influence of Maya or the influence of these patterns and habits that we're in. And uh, like when I, I try to get people to commit to at least two weeks of daily practice before they give it up, because most people will quit in the first two weeks. It's just the discomfort of something new. And we already have a flow of... We have a way of doing things and we have a Routine. flow that takes up our time already. Mm -hmm. So, you know, squeezing something new in that's a little bit discomforting, uh, most people don't don't ride that out. And uh, I, I learned a long time ago, I learned this important little truism that when you say yes to one thing, you're saying no to another. And so I always ask myself, okay, I'm saying yes to this. <laughs> What am I saying no to? And is that no more important? So when I first started to learn to meditate, I had to be at work at 730 and and I, I wanted to spend at least 30 minutes and I knew how much time it would take me to get ready for work and to drive to work. And so I came to the conclusion I was going to have to get up at five, at least 530 in the morning to be able to 
put in this new activity of contemplative prayer and meditation? Well, I need seven and a half hours sleep. So already that told me I had to be in bed at 10. Well, guess what? Between 10 and 12, I quite enjoyed uh, TV, late night TV watching. Some of my favorite reruns were on at that time. So for me to say yes to learning and establishing a, a meditation practice, I had to say no to Andy Griffith and no to Perry Mason and no to whatever Hill Street Blues or whatever show I was invested in at the time. So sometimes there's a little sacrifice involved to to move upward. And, you know, on my deathbed, am I going to feel bad I didn't see every episode of Perry Mason? Or am I going to be grateful? Five times. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just have many, many people on their deathbeds that say, dang, I wish I could have got that one more program in. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there is an inner resistance. And I think it's primarily contemplative practices are just very different from the way we have normally lived our lives. And that's essentially what makes them so effective, though. Because in our daily life, I mean, everything here is illusion and distraction. This isn't the real. I mean, we can say everything that we do has meaning and we invest all kind of meaning in things because we're meaning-making machines. But that's just to convince ourselves that we're not completely wasting our time. You know, there, there's a lot of things here that just aren't the real. The real is our connection with God. The real is our connection with our family. And if the more we can invest in the things that, that prop up the real, um, that's, I mean, that ties right into ritual for me. You know, earlier you were talking about how you try to make the time that you spend and the space that you're in sacred. And you're a very ritualistic person as a result of that mindfulness of sacred time and sacred space. That's obviously a catchphrase that, that caught my ear because as sort of a, uh, a proselyte of, of Mirce Eliade, the professor of comparative religion, he, he wrote a book called The Sacred and the Profane. And, and the crux of that book is, is the inherent need that we have as human beings to connect with sacred time and sacred space. And when we don't, it leads to serious consequences, neurosis even, when we're so disconnected from the sacred that everything that we are participating in is just profane. Life becomes very meaningless and nihilistic. And so it's super important for us to to tap back into sacred time and sacred space. And, and ritual is a very important way to do that, a very effective way to do that. Yeah, when I uh, when I was a graduate student at the University of Florida, it was quite by accident that uh, I went to study one day, and I just needed some quiet. So I went up onto a floor where very people, very few people, they weren't the kind of books that people were looking for. And uh, I went there one day to study for an exam, and I just had a good experience. I mean, I wasn't distracted; it felt good being there. I kind of liked the environment, so I started going back there every day to do my study. And it wasn't two weeks before, you know, being in the same place at the same time for the same purpose, I suddenly realized that my body mind was accustomed to that. And it almost it knew what I was going to do. It knew what the purpose of that time and space was. And uh, I realized that when I tried to study willy nilly here and there, it sometimes took a little bit of a while to get into it, so to speak, you know, to cut down the distractions and so forth. So there's something to say for having a holy space and a holy time. If, if you know, from 4.30 to 5 until 7.30 in the morning, I'm doing my personal spiritual routine. And I'm not saying people need to take that much time. I'm just, this is my thing right now. So um, my mind, body, soul, spirit knows that when I walk into my meditation room and close that door, it knows what's going to happen there and and uh, what it's about. And immediately there's uh, everything in me, physically, emotionally, spiritually, uh, is, is focused on the purpose of that morning ritual. And uh, it matters. I mean, it just that consistency and that sameness matters. So back to Atomic Habits, one of the things that he points out is that 
What you need in the early stages of forming good habits is success. You need to be able to feel success and have it be fairly immediate because we're used to gratification as kind of our feedback loop. You know, and we get, again, again, that dopamine spike, right? Where it's like, okay, I did something good. The dopamine hit feels good. It's something I want to do again. It's a feedback loop. So he suggests making the beginning of your habit something as short as two minutes and experience that success over and over and over and over and over for two minutes at a time, multiple times. And it's way more important to repeat the event than it is to make the event long, right? You don't want it to be an isolated three-hour thing and then you don't look at it again for three months or something. Much more important to, to get into it spend a little bit of time and then do it again tomorrow and the next day and the next, right? Right. So when I first started meditation, uh, it was so awkward. It was so difficult to do. And when I started, I, I, I actually started not for spiritual reasons, but for pain and stress management. So I was already uncomfortable and agitated. And so I, 10 minutes was all I could do. 10 minutes. If I did 10 minutes every morning, that was success. Even if the experience itself wasn't very successful for several days, the fact that I had done it two days, three days, four days in a row mattered. That was success. And then when I began to be able to uh, relax into my breathing and I could feel a relaxation coming into my mind, ah, well, now I'm having a very tangible benefit from my 10 minutes. And once I started to settle and to calm and be less distracted and less uh, stressed and agitated, then it was 12 minutes. And then it was 15 minutes. And then it was 20 minutes. And when I got to 20 minutes, much like exercise, uh, something magical happens. There's just something about 20 minutes that allows a process to be effective or to be substantive. And... And then from that point on, I extended my time just because it was so enlightening, so enlightening, so fun, so interesting, so empowering. I just started expending the, extending the time for the increased benefits. Uh, but I started at 10 and had to work into it. I love the, what you brought up earlier about this sort of inverted law of sacrifice that whenever you say yes to something, you have to say no to something else and how that automatically reordered your life for you by, by saying, I'm going to do a half an hour, an hour of this. And I, the best time to do it is this time. Well, that, that means I'm, I all of a sudden have to wake up earlier, which means I am sacrificing sleep, uh, at a later time that I would normally be watching my Andy Griffith or whatever. I have to be to bed early. Like it reordered your whole life. One decision that reordered your total routine. That's pretty powerful yes. when you think about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, I ended up having relief from the chronic pain, reduction in stress, and then and then an unexpected kind of spiritual expanding and awakening. And it turned out be, to be the best thing I'd ever done. One thing that uh, he points out in this book is you can be highly motivated, but if you don't have a system in place, it's not going to happen. And so uh, my wife and I, after we read the book, we were both complaining that we didn't exercise enough. I was going to the gym three days a week. I had a system. Day and time, I was at the gym cooking. And then COVID hit, and it uh, eliminated my gym experience. And then we, you know, she and I are sitting around whining about not exercising enough. Well, she had just read the book. So she said, well, we're going to make it more available. That's one of his principles. And, uh, and easier. So we... Uh, it took a whole day, but we emptied out a bedroom upstairs and we took the exercise equipment, which was in the basement, and moved it up directly across from our bedroom. So when we walk out of our bedroom in the morning, the first thing we're looking at is the exercise room and exercise equipment. But after a couple months went by, we hadn't exercised very much. And uh, I said, well, that, I guess that didn't work. And then it dawned on me, uh, we, we were faithful to two principles of his system. But we had no system. In other words, we didn't. We hadn't yet decided on on the day and time. We had the place, and so uh, it, it, you know, it did not get underway until that decision had been made. So we had to commit to the, you know, the time and the and the day to be able to do that. 
one of the things he says in here that relates directly to that is the more you ritualize the beginning of a process, the more likely it becomes that you can slip into the state of focus that is required to do great things. You, you have to have that system kind of laid out. And and the other quote that I love that he, he gives in the book uh, frequently is he says, focus on taking action, not being in motion. Being in motion is almost like busy work or planning. I'm planning to ultimately do something that I'm never going to actually do. I'm just going to plan for it ad, ad nauseum. And again, this kind of relates to the two-minute rule is that much better to just take action, do something for two minutes, even if you don't feel like you got a lot of benefit out of it. The the sneaky little tricky positive benefit that you might not even be aware of is just that you are inculcating that habit into your routine and it's becoming regular. And pretty soon it'll become, like I said, autonomic to the point where you don't even think about it. It just happens. And so that that kind of standardization of time and place, system, schedule, super important. Yeah. And and from a spiritual practice point of view, I do think it is, it is important to have that personal ritual that is deeply nourishing and healing and transforming. However, spiritual life also has to go throughout your day. And so developing habits that can can lead or uh, or uh, supplement or allow you to express spiritual life throughout the day throughout the day matter and it doesn't take a lot of time so I, I mentioned to you previously this book I had read some years ago called One Minute Manager and then it was One Minute Leader came out when I was a senior chaplain at an Air Force base I'm responsible for supervising all the services chapel activities the chaplains the chaplain assistants the volunteer staff and I had just read this one minute leader book. And the whole thing was you can transform your team. You can nourish, support, and encourage your team one minute at a time. You don't have to have a big seminar. You don't have to have a big plan uh, that takes a lot of time. And so I decided that I would take one minute to engage each staff member personally, you know, not something you have to engage them on because it's part of a schedule or a meeting or something you need done. But there would be a personal engagement, one minute each person. And I would keep notes, you know, if I notice somebody do a, a creative thing or a positive thing or a helpful thing, and I'd have it in mind. And every day for one minute, I would engage every staff member to see, number one, if there was any needs or problems I should be aware of that I could be helpful with. And then number two, to just communicate something uh, positive or uplifting or appreciative. One minute, and uh, after a couple of months, I, it, it was. Tra- and I'm I'm talking about doing this genuinely, right? Not just perfunctorily. Um, it was transformation to our en- entire staff, and nobody had a clue what I had done or what I was doing because it was so small. It was so small, but day after day after day, I I made a decision that. I was going to call my wife once a day during the work day, just tell her, hey, how's it going? I love you, blah, 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 whatever I had on my mind and heart. And I would actually put it in, I'd look at my day and I'd put that one minute call in my calendar and I would call. Now you could say, well, that's, I had people say to me, why you put it on your calendar? Well, that can't be genuine. No, it can be genuine. I really care for her. I really love her. I want to express that, right? Now I've scheduled a time to formally do that. So it doesn't get lost. It doesn't get forgotten. Something doesn't take it, that opportunity away from me. So every day I would call for that one minute, you know, just to express appreciation for something or love for something. One minute, day after day, month after month, year after year. Do you see? It matters. It really matters. Now we're, in, you know, I'm retired and we're, we're bumping around in the same house all day together. And, and so my habit now is, and it's a habit, my habit now is I touch her Every time I'm within reach, okay, uh, it's maybe two seconds, it's maybe three seconds, but I do not pass her without touching her in some way. And she knows that my primary love language is non-sexual touching, okay? So if you've ever done a program on love language, there's that's a fun topic. But anyway, uh, so, you know, maybe this happens 20, 30, 40 times a day, right? Three seconds. It just matters having those kinds of habits. I, uh, you might have seen this on my Interpath Facebook page. I, I put it on a couple a week or two ago. I can't remember what motivated me to do this, but 
I, I decided as I was going into Walmart that among looking for the stuff I wanted to buy, I was going to radiate goodness. That was going to be my my spiritual practice for the day at Walmart. And I just walked around with my buggy and with the conscious intention of radiating goodness to each person I passed by. It was amazing. It was transformative. I'm suddenly wishing better things for people. I, I found myself not making knee-jerk, habitual judgments, right? Just from appearance uh, that are easy to do. And so I'm just radiating goodness all the whole time I was in there. Well, then I extended it to Costco. It seems like I spent half my life in Walmart and Costco, so it's quite an extensive spiritual practice now. But this morning I was in Walmart. I went and got the oil changed at 7 a.m. and stopped at Walmart at 8. And I'm going around picking up a few things for my wife. And I just had so much fun radiating goodness, right? God's present, divine nature is present, uh, divine love is present. And so I'm going to, I'm going to take a 10 seconds to become in tune with that. And then I'm going to radiate that goodness. And I'm telling you, it was just so much fun this morning. And uh, a young Hispanic guy who works there uh, came up to me and we just started talking and it turned into a 10 minute conversation. He probably got in trouble, but it was a fabulous human connection. And we had these these uh, kind of synchronistic things to share where we had lived in Brazil in a, in a, in a nearby. We lived in Florida in a similar place. And uh, so there are so many simple things that can be done habitually that just matter. And it doesn't it just doesn't take a lot of effort and planning and so forth. Well, it seems to me, uh, Phil, you're you're an experienced guy uh, in life, and you, you've done a lot of things. And one of the things that you've become more conscious and aware of over the past few decades is is incorporating these these small practices into your life and and making them habitual. And the interesting thing to me is to hear this transformation, uh, this this story of your transformation, to the point now where. You want to experience this at every moment. And that to me, that's very hopeful to hear that, you know, and I hope that people that are listening feel that because, it, again, it seems to me you're on this plane where everywhere you go now, you want to experience some kind of divine human connection. And I, I just think that's, I, I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful to hear the possibilities and it gives me something to aspire to. So. You know, we're running up on an hour. I wanted to swing back around to a couple ideas that were mentioned here that I think are very helpful for the audience. Number one is the amount of time that it takes is not so much as you think it might be. And whatever the it is, you can do it in in very small bites. You don't eat that elephant all in one meal. It's one bite at a time. And so small small things like just sitting in stillness, breathing for a minute or two, and doing that for a couple of weeks straight will put you on a path to desiring more. And uh, and then I wanted to come back to this, this idea that you expressed about the sacrament and being present. In fact, all of these ideas and practices really boil down to being aware and present in the moments that we live right now. And I think it's so important to and, and this is how we imbue these what might otherwise be mundane moments with a sense of ritual importance is when we become present to what's going on in that moment. And so that would be my urging for those who are wanting to experience the transformative power of, of habits and ritual is to Practice them with intention. Be present to the things you're doing. Don't let your unconscious actions guide your life. Let's be, let's be agents. Let's be involved. Let's exercise our will and use these great tools to our advantage to build a life of really positive automated spiritual habits. And so I'd I'm really uh, excited about you have you having come on today, Phil. I really appreciate the time that you took to do so, and I wanted to give you the last word. Do you have any closing thoughts for us? Oh no, I, I think it's important. You know, people need to ask the questions: Do the things I do habitually help me or hurt me? 
do they enhance life for myself and others, or do they detract in some way? I mean, it's important to become really aware of that. And, and once you realize that there's maybe area, a lot of areas that would, you would like to change, then start small. You know, start with one thing you can do in a short period of time. Do it consistently until it's a habit. And then move on, you know, move on to something else. Um, when I did that one minute thing with my staff, wow. When I started the one minute thing with my wife, wow. And it's just a habit now that I do that. I don't think about it. It just happens. And, um, and sometimes you can, you know, we talked about this earlier offline, but, you know, our habits often craft our identity. But sometimes we can say, dang it this is the person I really want to be from my soul level. You know, you, you, you come to terms with what you want your identity to be. And then you just say, okay, what, what, what patterns, what habits are going to sustain that identity? And so you can go that way too. And you might not even know what the patterns or habits are that would get you to that end point. And so, and an idea we kind of talked about before is that sometimes you can see other people that you think are doing it right. They've arrived at that spot that you want to be. And so if you don't know what to do, study their life. Sure. Look at what they're doing. Ask them. And, and that's the importance of mentors. We did a whole episode on the importance of mentors. They're so important to have people in your life that, that have arrived at a spot that you'd like to be and can help you and and more than likely would be excited and willing to help you if only you would ask. Yeah, I, I would say, look, get out of the reactive, the, the typical human ego reactive patterns that we've been in our whole lives. Uh, realize that when you unite your body and your mind, particularly with uh, an awareness of God's love for you, desire for you to be Christ-like and his willingness to uh, move into your life with grace and with love, that there's there are really few things that you can't change, particularly in terms of character and how you want to desire and think and love and care and share and give and so forth. Um, I mean, the whole life and presence and power of God is available to us to do those things. And so we just get trapped in bad ways or ineffective ways of trying to change when there are some fabulous principles like there are in this book. And there are some fabulous spiritual teachings that when wedded can allow us in these bite-sized chunks to make these, these very significant inner transformations. So... Um, you know, I'll end with Romans 12, too, that I like so much. You know, be not conformed to this world. Most people are conformed to this world, and that conforming takes the place of, of reactive habits and patterns that often are not in our best interest. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that word mind just didn't mean your thinking. It meant your 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 psyche, your the way you feel, the way you desire, what's important to you, that all needs to be um, transformed. And then you naturally start to do those things that are your heart's desire. You start to establish those habits and patterns that reflect that inner transformation. And then fun things come along. Like my radiate goodness. I don't know. I just, I forget what I read that prompted that. And heck, let's give it a try. And I tried it and it soon became, you know, it had its own reward built in. So now it's uh, habitual in, in those two stores. <laughs> anyway, You caught it on the, uh, the, the, the retail singular level and on the wholesale bulk level. Uh, <laughs> Costco so, and Walmart. <laughs> yeah. Well, Phil, thanks again for coming on the program. Sure appreciate you doing this. I, I learned a lot this time around, and I'm excited for this episode to come out. I think it's going to be really helpful for us all. Look forward to having you on again soon. Oh, it's always uh, enjoyable and meaningful. Thank you. Well, for Latter-day Contemplation, I'm Riley Risto. Have a great week.